Yes, and I'm Mariana Mazzucato, the director and founder of the Institute. I'm Ronan Keating, our chief exec of the British Library. And what this whole series has been about is really bringing together people from very different domains. Is this microphone on? You can hear me? Yeah, you're good. Um, from economists, obviously, because we're the smart ones. No. Um, no. Most of this has been about librarians. No. Um, artists, designers, architects. There's been an over, I think, subscription of the architects part of it because we actually are housed. The Institute is housed in the Bartlett which is the school for the built environment at UCL. And that itself has been very interesting for us because as an institute which is trying to rethink what markets are, markets as outcomes of the interactions between different types of agents, public, private, civil society, these interactions are fundamentally designed. They don't just come about. And also the different organizations have different governance structures which themselves are designed. And so very much at the center of our rethinking about public value, public purpose, and the public realm has been this question of design and what are the actual outcomes that we're striving for. Um, and in fact, our first uh, talk was Rolly and I, and I don't know if you want to just give a sort of quick synopsis of what we talked about, but it was very much kind of digging into Rolly's brain, which was about his experience in the British Library and the BBC. Yeah, we were talking about how you design purpose into organizations uh, and the work we did at the BBC years ago, thinking about public value, which was like a concept which didn't seem to be spoken of at the time, and we asserted that it existed and then set about filling it with meaning. Yeah. Uh, and that's what you've now set up an institute to do, which yes. I guess is how we, we reconnected around this dialogue now. And on the one hand, I think that we're trying to be quite visionary about this. That's why we have you know, a rock star, like literally a rock star tonight, like Ryan Eno. But also very practical. So we've been talking to the Treasury, for example, and believe me, this has actually been as exciting as talking to Ryan Eno, um, about how do you evaluate um, public value? You know, will the Green Book have to be fundamentally transformed? Do the net present value calculations and does the cost benefit calculation that the Treasury has actually kill any sort of real public purpose <laughs> and mission orientedness from the start. And in fact, um, we actually very much want to continue this series. We are um, in the process of designing the 2019 series. It was very likely, if you're the first to hear about this, that it will be around the theme of turning private data into a public good, bringing together and being a thorn in the side uh, to the big data and AI, artificial intelligence community globally and asking what does this actually mean for things like the welfare state and its future. But anyway, um, I'm going to let Finn introduce Brian, but really, Roly and I just wanted to give you guys sort of a communal hug <laughs> and say that it's been fantastic doing this together, and it's not the end. Finn is really the best uh, provocateur and moderator for Brian. Um, the talk tonight will be very much about the long now, so both thinking about how now we can actually transform this, but how we also need a historical and a long-run perspective on that transformation. And what Finn is doing with his colleagues, including uh, Pooja Agrawal, who is also an IAPP fellow, as is Finn, they're trying to do something which is absolutely incredible, which is to bring back uh, visionary designers and architects to the heart of government can't remember the statistic, and I tend to exaggerate it. I, I exaggerate everything, but something like, I can't remember, it's 49%. over 49? Oh, God, I said 70% in my tweet. Anyway, for over 49%, <laughs> to say over, of top designers and architects actually used to work for the public sector. And now it's? 0.7. Not 0.7, so less than 1%. Um, and he set up a whole uh, organization in order to do that. And so he's trying to bring vision, mission, public purpose back to the heart of local government, and we are going to be working very closely with Finn's team to set up our new Masters in Public Administration, which will be very much about creating this new toolkit for civil servants in this more ambitious way. Lastly, and then we will get off the I've stage. Yes, yes, yep. sorry. Uh, just, you do have a flyer on your seat about an amazing lecture that will be had at UCL on capitalism, the history of an illusion by Fred Block, who is an incredible sociologist at UC Davis, and please do come. I was Ryan. just going to conclude, but you reminded me tonight's theme is the longer now, the long now. Brian, I think my path first crossed with you when you did the music for How Buildings Learn, Stuart Brand's series mm -hmm. uh, that I was producing at the BBC. And that got me thinking then, it's probably why I've ended up here, about what now means, what duration, what planning for the future means. 
And I just your point about architecture, looking around this building, this extraordinary building we have the privilege of working in, this building was a public building commissioned and designed to last at least 250 years. Mm -hmm. And you feel that as you touch it, you look around, as you work it, you think about its functionality. The depth of thought here is quite extraordinary, and therefore it's a very living question, mm -hmm. this, about how you literally encode that into, a, into the built environment, uh, into planning. And just to pay tribute, it was a, uh, it's often said to be designed by Colin St. John Wilson. That's true, he was the lead architect. But I think it was co-designed by an extraordinary woman uh, who died in the last 10 years, MJ Long. Uh, and so I just want to pay tribute to that kind of visionary, thoughtful design because we're literally living in it. And I look forward to hearing more about it. Thank That's you great. very much. So thank, thank you very much. Over thank to you. Us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Roly, Mariana. Thanks to the IPP, British Library, uh, and for all of you for, for joining the conversation. So formally speaking, I should introduce uh, Brian Eno, but um, Brian needs no introduction. Um, I'm pretty sure we're all here because we've listened to his music, uh, experienced his artworks, uh, read, his, read about his thinking, his ideas, uh, probably more so than because everyone shares my passion for town planning. Um, but I, I do have a theory, uh, a theory that I'd like to explore this evening, that Brian is a rock star who is actually secretly a frustrated town planner. Um, <laughs> at least it seems to me uh, that all this time he's been using music and art to explore uh, ideas that are actually really fundamental to the way our cities and places change. Um, ideas that have certainly inspired my practice as a public planner. And in particular, like Rowley, uh, I think... Brian's concept of the long now, also the big, big here, is extremely important for how we think about the public realm, public value, uh, and, and politics in general. Uh, it's also extremely topical uh, at a time when national leaders are increasingly um, peddling a world view based on a shorter now uh, and a smaller here. So, so that's where I'd like to start, really, Brian. Uh, the long now as an idea, where did that come from? <coughs> I, um, I moved to New York in 1978 to downtown New York and was hanging out there and I one evening met a well-known public figure who shall remain nameless who invited me to a dinner at her loft, her new loft. Um, I didn't know New York very well so I just took the address and subsequently took a taxi and the taxi went to a more and more broken and corrupt part of town um, with steam issuing up out of the streets and uh, broken alcoholics falling around into door doorways and so on. And I thought, this guy is taking me on a ride. You know, this can't be where she lives. And we got to the address and I rang the doorbell. There was actually a guy slumped in the doorway and the voice came down, oh, yes, just come in and get in the lift and come up to the sixth floor. And I emerged in the sixth floor into this incredible palace, which had cost $3 million in 1978 to make. And I thought that was so mysterious, to have this, this incredible luxury in what must have been the worst part of town, you know, uh, the most broken part of New York. And later on, I was talking to her, and I said... Um, how do you feel about living here? And she said, oh, it's just, it's just fabulous. I love it. Look, it's just beautiful. We had so-and-so design this, and that's by such and such a person. And she was very enthusiastic about it. But I realized that when I said here, I meant something different from what she meant. When she said here, she meant everything that I can lock up, <laughs> everything behind my doors sort of thing. The, the neighborhood didn't exist for her. Now, this was round about the time that um, Margaret Thatcher was saying there's no such thing as society, um, which struck me as exactly the same kind of view, that the only thing that matters is the bit that I own. I'm not responsible for any of the rest of that. I don't actually think about it. I don't care about it. And indeed, she didn't, this particular woman. She would have a limo come and pick her up if she was going anywhere, and it would bring her back at night. So as far as she was concerned, she lived in this idyllic bubble, and the rest of it didn't exist for her. And so I, I suddenly thought, so 
people live in different sizes of here. The word here, H-E-R-E, means something different for different people. For me, it meant at least the neighborhood. Actually, it meant the city, really, um, and to some extent the country as well. But for her, it meant her apartment. Um, and then I started thinking about other people I'd met in New York and how they thought about time. And I realized there was something analogous in that as well. If you said to people, what do you do? They would tend to tell you in quite a lot of detail about what they were doing this week or this month. They didn't tell you a sort of long-term story of what they did, what, what they were interested in, what things had moved them to do this and what they expected it to turn out to in the future. And so then I came up with this idea that they lived in a small here and a short now. I mean, it was all very energetic and exciting, but it sort of dropped off at the end of the week. There was, there was like a chasm of the unknown at the end of the week or outside your front door. Um, so then I started thinking about this idea of a long now. What would it be like to live conscious of the fact that what you do now resonates for a very, very, very long time? That, that your actions are not are not limited, actually. And this seemed to me particularly critical at a time when, as, as creatures, we're more powerful than we've ever been, so that things we're doing now will actually resonate for several hundred and thousands of years, in fact. Um, so, and yet, at the same time, we, we seem to be like the lady with her apartment. We take less and less responsibility for the future. We have more and more power over it, and we take less and less responsibility for it. So that was 1978. In yeah. the last 40 years, I mean, even then, uh, our idea of now as a society must have shrunk further. Uh, even if you take new cycles as an example, yes, 1978, I expect, wasn't quite alive then, um, but we, we, we took in news on perhaps a, a daily basis, um, newspapers then. Uh, issued daily, but since then those cycles have only shrunk. So if you think about um, the use of uh, well, the way we use social media now, um, I'm frustrated if the headline on my homepage hasn't changed within three hours. Mm -hmm. Go back much further in time, and news I suppose started with the idea of annals, which yeah. changed every year. Yeah. Um, uh, and then at some point, I think the first new newspapers were issued in Italy. Um, uh, weekly, uh, mm. and uh, and then it spread weekly to Germany. As print, the printing presses became more sophisticated, it went to kind of every twice a week, and then mm. to daily. Mm. What what's the implications of these of these shrinking cycles? This kind of speeding up of of yeah. our idea of now. What what's it doing to society? Well, the effect has been to make the most dramatic news the news. Mm. So. So things that make, if it, if it bleeds, it leads, is the expression, I think, isn't it? So things that have the most immediate impact um, become the news. And in fact, it's kind of disproportionate because there are very, very serious and important long-term things happening that aren't, don't ever become a story. Yeah. Well, global warming is the mm. most obvious example. That, that should be the headline every day in the paper, really. You know, that's the big story. Um, and I, th I think in the last couple of years that people have started to realise that, that that is the big story. So how do we make space for those bigger stories that inevitably are the ones that talk more about public value? Yeah. Um, well, I think you have to get people to accept slowing down a little bit, to accept uh, a lower rate of stimulus, because that, that's what it's about. We're addicted to stimulus. Mm. You know, the whole, the whole thing of using your phone all the time is to get a little hit, one after the other. It's like snacking, endlessly snacking, and, and never actually having a meal. Um, and I feel this is, a, this is unhealthy, as it, as it would be for you as a human if you only ever snacked mm. on little sweet things, little tasty things, mm. and you never actually had a vegetable. A whole, a whole vegetable. One that's really difficult to chew, some celery. The, I've seen this 
firsthand bringing it to the built environment and my understanding of public value in the built environment, seeing it firsthand, having experience working in government at a local government level, mm -hmm. um, where a time scale for a hand in for a briefing note might be a week, yeah. to a city government level where you're expected to turn things around in a day, to dealing with central government where the deadline is really uh, an hour, maybe 40 minutes. Um, that's, so, that's so much the wrong way around. Isn't and, it? and so that the, the ability to really think long term, to think uh, about a longer now, a bigger, bigger here, is so constrained by this constant churn, yeah. which is in its, by its nature very reactive because you're more exposed to those very short term news cycles mm -hmm. um, of, of responses on social media. And I think, I think you can see the same thing happening in the built environment in terms of um, investment models or mm -hmm. economics. So. Uh, so we all know that the, the kind of buildings that do last, the British Library, the ones that we value in the future, the ones that we value, value from the past were built uh, with economic models that, um, that where the, the builders were incentivized to really invest in good quality materials, mm -hmm. to care about how that building was mm -hmm. maintained, whether that was the 5% philanthropists in Victorian times or uh, actually the visionary council estate uh, programs in yeah. the 50s and 60s. But what you see now increasingly uh, is that a large proportion of um, the built environment being produced based on economic models that, that are really about speed, return on capital employed, yeah. so how quickly yeah. you can put money in and get it out. Yeah. Um, and that's the definition of, of success. Um, so, uh, yeah, I wonder how is that, um, how do you think that is playing out in the built environment in particular? Is that the kind of thing you pick up on, that you perceive? Uh, well, I remember cities. last time I was in Tokyo, I, I went to a place where I had had a show. I'd had an installation in a building in Tokyo, and it was a brand new building when I had the installation, which was about 12 years before, and the building was gone. Hmm. So that building had stood for 13 years, I think. And I said to my friends, was there something wrong with it? Did they... <laughs> and um, they said, oh, no, well, land is so expensive in Tokyo that the cost of the building is relatively trivial mm -hmm. compared to the cost of the land. So if you can afford to buy a piece of land, you might as well just put a new building on it. Um, mm -hmm. So this was a whole new way of thinking about building to me, the building with a view that this probably isn't going to last for 15, more than 15 years, so don't let's bother mm -hmm. with being too fancy with it. But... The, the other thing in relation to what you were just saying was that noticing over the period of my life how um, the priorities of public figures like politicians and corporations have become shorter and shorter. Um, for instance, corporations are really worried about the quarterly report, the next quarterly report, and their shareholders are really concerned about it. You know, they want returns and... They don't want somebody heroically making a long-term investment for the social good, because that doesn't pay off well, generally. Um, they want people who are going to produce results, you know, next May or next September or whatever. Um, similarly with politicians, I mean, the fact that we are actually now doing politics on Twitter is, oh. is pretty astonishing, isn't it? It's, it's not only the... Um, reduction of time that's involved in that so the reduction in time to think about anything but also the fact that you get 280 characters well I, I may be just a bit, little bit too verbose for the medium but I can't really seem to say anything very important in 280 characters <laughs> the, I should say by the way that we've got a a set of books in front of us, oh, yeah. not just because it's the British Library, um, <laughs> but for us to dip into uh, once in a while. And one of the, those books that immediately, um, the comments you just made made me think of, was, was a book that Rowley referred to in his introduction, How Buildings Learn, Stuart Brand. And there's a great diagram in here that shows um, how that... Should we, should we put it up there? Projector, yeah. Um, so Stuart was one of the founders of the Long Now Foundation. We started it in... 1996, um, and this book, it, I think, is one of the really great books about architecture, actually, and about building. And one of the things he says in it, you're probably going to say this later anyway, but <laughs> he says, um, 
you don't finish a building, you start it. And that has become a very important idea for me in terms of music as well, the idea of trying to make pieces that are sort of organisms that then have a life separate from you, that keep evolving and developing. I should probably jumping the gun a bit there. But anyway, this, this, um, this lovely diagram, this is to do with rates of change. So the things in the center of the building, can you still hear me when I turn around? Yeah. Okay, I keep doing that. <laughs> um, the things in the center of the building, that's to say the furniture, etc., can change quite quickly. And the things at the outside, the structure and the site, change very slowly. So this is to do with rates of change of something. Now, um, we have another diagram in that book, one that Stuart and I came up with together, which is about um, civilization. Do, do you, do you know where that is? I'll find it. Um, to do, it's the same thing applied to civilization, if you like. Um, Somewhat ironically, my copy of this book's completely fallen apart. <laughs> and so I may not be able to find it. Uh, uh, you know what? It might not even be in that book. Mm. It might be. <laughs> no, I, I, think it's in the, I think it's in the clock of the long now, okay, I'll, which I haven't I'll bring got this one back for now. Yeah. Anyway, it's a similar idea that, that, that human affairs change at different levels at different speeds. So the top level is sort of fashion. Um, and the and then it goes down through culture and right down to uh, genetics, basically, nature. Um, so mm. what's, what's happened is that many of the things that theoretically should exist at slower levels of change, like governance and culture, have sort of been accelerated up into the fashion zone. <laughs> so, so they're being forced to change, or at least to think about change, in those, in those too fast terms, I think. I mean, I don't want to sound like an old fart here, so you know, it's, all, it's all going much too fast now, you know, you can't, you can't keep but, up with anything anymore. But, but that's, that's why that diagram's useful, because it's not saying that everything has to be slow, or everything has to be no. fast, but that there can be gears of change that can operate at different speeds, but yes. we need to be aware of that. And I think I, I've always imagined that diagram keeping on going, to the, not just the building, but then the scale of the city and the different kind of infrastructure that sits in a yes. city. The question for me is who's really thinking about those slower cogs, who's in the absence of uh, political um, thinking that goes beyond uh, the horizons of electoral terms, or as you said at companies who increasingly determine our built environment, thinking beyond their next quarterly report. Mm -hmm. uh, who's, really, um, who's really doing that long-term thinking? And I think that's where the role of, of the bureaucrat or the public planner um, really uh, has, a, um, has an ongoing um, value mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and needs to be strengthened as well, particularly in, in relation Yeah, we've to decided we both like bureaucrats. Yeah. <laughs> they, they get a bad deal because, you know, they don't look as glamorous as artists. But, but actually, um, what, what bureaucrats are doing, in a way, is sort of stabilising knowledge and stabilizing arrangements, making consensus, getting things, keeping things running, um, and sometimes innovating quite um, radically. Um, I, I brought in this book, not because I intend to quote from it, but it's called, it's by Tom Bingham, who was a judge, senior judge, and it's called The Rule of Law. And it's about law, um, about how law works and how it came about. And I've always thought that law was one of the great achievements of humankind, the idea that we could actually come together, um, bury our immediate instinctual um, response to get angry and kill somebody or take their wife or whatever else, and actually work out ways of having agreements and agree on them and generally enforce them. I mean, by and large, we, we live very successfully within a set of laws. And, of course, sometimes we have to change them and modify them. But the process works well. And the fact that humans have been doing this at least since um, the 8th century BC with the Sumerians um, have been codifying sets of laws and agreeing on them and agreeing on how they, that it's a good idea that we have them. It's, it's an incredible achievement. It's, it's like a huge building, but it's a... Mm. 
completely conceptual building. Um, so that's that's what bureaucrats do, yeah. <laughs> actually. And and we're hearing a lot about bureaucrats right now in um, Donald Trump's administration, the resistance from within the White House, and oh, actually yes. that, you know, uh, whether they're expressing it in the right way or not, there's there's a uh, um, an a role for the bureaucrat actually as an activist mm -hmm. um, within that administration to um, argue for the longer now, for the bigger here, um, when um, when perhaps the yeah the the president of the United States is isn't necessarily thinking in those open no. and long. Well, terms. he's a he's a property developer, you know. <laughs> so he's <laughs> return he's on capital employed. Return on capital. Yeah, that's that's what he'll be thinking about. Mm. If you want people to think long term, you have to. Um, make them comfortable and <laughs> give them the support to do that. Mm. You know, this is why so many of the, in Mariana's, is it her first book, The um, Entrepreneurial this State? One. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, the real, the real um, surprise of that book for me is the discovery that most of the things that one had assumed were the result of um, clever capitalists like Steve Jobs having clever ideas actually were the results of clever capitalists like Steve Jobs commandeering ideas that were produced on public money. Yeah. Um, so, so this is a much more interesting and bigger picture than we're generally... We're generally given the idea that there are a sort of a few brilliant people here and there who come up with these amazing ideas and, then, and make a lot of money, of course, as they should. Um, but, in fact, it turns out that these amazing ideas are not... Um, sort of out of one person's head. They, I, I have this expression, which is, um, if I can remember it. Um, no, I can't remember it. <laughs> I, I'm about to quote myself, but I always forget. <laughs> well, let's come on to the seniors, because I think that's where we're, we're heading. We, we... Great, good ideas are articulated by one person, but usually um, imagined by a community. Mm. So they're, they're usually the results of lots and lots of input. And then one person thinks of a way of saying them and mm. encapsulates them in some way. It doesn't mean that one person is not important, but it means they're less important than the sort of Beethovenian yeah. image that they're generally given. Which, which is a, a kind of false um, history that's particularly afflicted the architecture and built environment mm. um, fields. No, thanks in no small part to people like Ayn Rand, and the image of the heroic, individualistic, yeah. genius architect um, who've, uh, who somehow um, yeah, imagined the city into being on their own. Um, and you know, the, the heroes for me are people like Cedric Price, uh, mm -hmm. British architect, who refused to, um, to say that any one building uh, was, was authored by any one individual, because uh, where do you stop? Mm -hmm. you know, how about the engineers? How about the builders? Yeah. How about the client? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I wondered, um, you know, how that kind of idea of the seniors might relate to the, the longer now and the bigger here. We've both, mm -hmm. we've discussed this idea of a kind of, well, quite obviously a longer sense of time, a longer area. How about this kind of broader sense of... Mm -hmm. of um, so I should explain, I should explain yeah. that word. Um, seniors is a word I came up with um, quite a few years ago after visiting an exhibition at the Barbican which was um, of Russian revolutionary art from 1906 to 1927 or something like that, which was the area of art that I thought I knew most about. It was the area that I was most interested in at art school, and I thought I had a pretty good handle on it. I went to this show, and there was a lot of work there that had never been seen out of Russia before. And not only were there a lot of paintings I had never seen before, but there were a lot of artists that I'd never even heard of, and they were really good. They weren't sort of second tier. They looked as good as the big names. And then I started reading more about St. Petersburg and Moscow during that period, which was where most of this work was being produced. And I started to realise that the sort of ecology of those scenes, St. Petersburg and Moscow, was was so rich and so complex and that it involved all sorts of people, not only painters and musicians and people that you would normally call artists, but salonists and 
technologists, people who made machinery and things, um, the hangers-on, all the people around a scene who actually feed into it, and collectors, of course. You know, one of the really important figures was um, uh, Sergei Shachukin, who um, was a, a rich textiles manufacturer who could afford to buy a lot of art, and he kept a lot of artists going, including Picasso and Matisse, actually, mm. uh, but also the Russian artists. So, so when, when you started to examine this scene, it was really like looking at a piece of nature where you, you get the impression that the important creatures, you know, the wolves and the lions and so on. But then you start going down to the sort of bacterial level of mm. how, what keeps the soil going, what, what actually keeps the whole system running. And you get into ecology. So I thought of this word because I, I thought we, we have grown up with this notion of genius, that there are these wonderful, gifted individuals walking around changing everything. But in fact... The, more, the closer you look at a situation, and it isn't only cultural ones, you know, you think of Bletchley Park or the Manhattan Project or um, uh, Xerox Park. Um, lots of these big systems where a lot of people were involved. The closer you get to them, the less easy it is to distinguish and separate out these key figures. They seem to be the result of the whole... Um, turmoil there. Um, so I said, inst I thought instead of genius, we should use this new word, senius, which is the intelligence of a whole community, the creative intelligence of a whole community. So I started using that word, and now I think there is a company in India who've called themselves senius. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> it's catching on. The... Um I mean, to, to relate it back to the built environment, because that's all I know about. And uh, I think, you know, th there's, a, there's clearly a line of thinking there. Going back to Jane Jacobs, mm -hmm. that quote, cities have the capability of providing something for everyone only because and only when they're created uh, by everybody, um, which is a kind of respect to the fact that the most interesting and complex places are made by, made by many hands. Yes. Um, but there's a really important role there uh, I think for the planner as someone who facilitates that kind of mm -hmm. yeah. um, diversity of authorship and in fact equality of authorship uh, and uh, and I've always thought there's a slight parallel there with the descriptions you make uh, you, you give of, of good music producers mm -hmm. you know, people who kind of sit in the background and just create the conditions yeah. uh, for good music to come about do you have that um, do you have Richard Sennett's book here yeah it, well, the latest one. I, I just want to, yeah, I just want to give an example of exactly the opposite of what we're talking about, which is um, that picture he has of Le Corbusier's Le Voisin. Oh yeah. Is that in here? I'll find it and put it up. Here it is. Yeah. This. <laughs> it's just a, such an amazing picture. So back to 1924, when Le Corbusier is designing the city of the future. Um, so that's where you can say there's no such thing as society. <laughs> you know, that, that would really kill any chance of it, I think. These, these things, by the way, which look like cooling fins on the back of your computer are actually houses. Um, these are buildings. Oops. Oh, sorry. <laughs> they were buildings and built before, the before they took off. <laughs> Some of <the> strange lags. <laughs> but this, this idea that... Um, human beings were sort of units that you stack up together in that way and you don't really think about what their relationship to the outside is or what their relationship to each other is. That's the, that's the essence of treating people like individuals rather than as members of communities. Mm. And uh, I suppose this... Um you know, Richard Sennett in that book talks about the importance of um, complexity, of the unknown, mm -hmm. um, of ambiguity in the city, uh, and um, the danger of, of kind of complex top-down planning that produces simple places. Yeah. So uh, something I've always been interested in is we, we talk 
about the rule of law and laws before, but the way you use rules and, um, uh, and open systems uh, generative to, mm -hmm. to generate different kinds of music and the possible relationships that might have to the ways that planners could create more open systems of change within cities. Yeah, so um, some of you, you will know that I've been working on this idea called generative music for some time. So generative music is an idea that instead of designing a piece of music in full detail, which is how you imagine symphonies may have been written in the past where every note is written down and the piece sort of pre-exists its performance in a way. It's, all, it's already there. It's like an architect's plan for a building. Everything is kind of catered for in the, in the uh, initial description of the piece, the score. Um, instead of that, imagine a piece of music where you set in motion a few rules and you give a few possible behaviours and then you see what happens when they combine. So to give you an example of this, I, I'm sorry for you who've heard me speak before because you'll be very bored, but um, a very good example uh, and one of the first pieces really that worked like this was Terry Riley's In C. It's a very simple piece. It has, um, I think it's 52 bars in the key of C. Um, and the 52 bars all written out on a piece of, on a score as you would expect them to be. The only difference with this piece from any other is that uh, any group of instruments can play it. Um, every group is going to play exactly the same piece. They, they will play the same bars. They don't have separate parts for different instruments. And each player moves through at their own speed, and that's the crucial thing. So at the beginning of the piece, which has a pulse, so everyone stays in time together, at the beginning of the piece, you all start on bar one. So initially, everyone's playing in unison. But the rules are that you move on to bar two whenever you feel like it. And you might move on to bar two s several minutes before I do. Mm -hmm. And he might move on a little bit later, and she might move on earlier. So, so quite quickly, there'll be some people playing bar one and some people playing bar two at the same time. And then... Um, late, you know, quite soon into the piece, there'll be several different bars being played by different instruments. And in the middle of the piece, there can be 20 or 30 different um, musical statements going on together. Well, it's all in the key of C, so it all fits together and it all works. But what's interesting about this piece is that it's very, very simple. Every performance of it is different. Uh, I've never heard a bad performance of it. I, I worked on a performance once with a Chinese classical orchestra with um, classical instruments, and that sounded great as well. So I thought this was a very interesting new idea in composition, that instead of writing down how you wanted this piece to be, you kind of gave the performers a toolkit, and you said, OK, just use these and work your way through it. Oh, the other rule I should have said is that everybody has to end on the same bar. So the, so the kind of profile of the piece is that it starts, everybody's in unison. At a certain point, nearly everybody is playing something different, and it, then it goes back to all being unison again at the end. It's, it's a beautiful idea. Um, but I started to try to think of an explanation of this, and I thought, in a way, classical music is sort of like architecture in that you give a precise plan for how the piece is going to be. But this isn't like architecture at all. It's more like gardening. It's, it's more like planting some seeds and then watching how they come up. And every year it's going to be different. You know, every time you plant those seeds, it will be different. So um, I, th I thought this was a different vision for, for how art could be, what, what art could be like. But for me, that's the, in a way, the definition of the difference between architecture and planning mm -hmm. in its broader sense. Yes. Is that, uh, in fact, Rem, who Kohlhaas, who we were talking about before, says that architecture is really about exploiting opportunities, whereas good planning is about creating opportunities. And mm -hmm. it's about trying to create 
uh, allow things to continue to happen that you haven't necessarily anticipated, enjoying the unexpected, yeah. uh, and which is obviously something you do in your music. Are there bits of cities or places that particularly capture that spirit of the unexpected um, that have come about in that, that kind of... Um, well, a lot of old... I think a lot of old cities are like that. I mean, they're, they're so idiosyncratic, you know, because um, so many forces... That, that's the point, I think, the complexity of the forces that have moulded the place. If, if the only force is Le Corbusier's brain, then you get something as simplistic as that. Mm. Um, but usually in old cities, there are, there's such a multitude of forces. Of, you know, where, which, where can a stagecoach pass through? Where is the sewer? Uh, where's the church? Mm. All, all these pre-existing conditions that give rise to what people do, that they are absolutely the opposite of what Le Corbusier is doing, where he's trying to work on a sort of tabula rasa, mm. start from nothing, ground zero, and build the ideal city. Mm. It, he's a terrible architect, really, isn't he? <laughs> I mean, he you've got to admit, got until the end of his life, his career. Yeah, at the end, he sort of mellowed off a little bit. But there, you certainly talk Perhaps architects, architects shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed to build anything till or they're do, 50. Or do anything on their own. Yeah, they <laughs> or want, do anything yeah. alone, yeah. Um, the, you know, you're taught in architecture school really to um, distrust the idea of compromise in the same way as yes. we distrust bureaucracy as only seen to be a negative word. Yes. Compromise is, is seen to be something that inevitably means a watering down, a dilution, yes, yes. Um, a weakening of, an, of a concept and an idea. Something that's always really fascinated me about rules mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the way that um, developers and built environment um, practitioners respond to planning policy. So we looked at, uh, to get working together with David Knight, a uh, friend of mine, we looked at all of the regulations, I should show this, um, that uh, contemporary housing has to go through. So this maze of, of uh, planning regulations, mm -hmm. um, all these different policy documents and, and guidance. And we actually applied that, funnily enough, to one of Corbusier's archetypal homes. Mm -hmm. So this is... is that um, a home? Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's call it a machine for living in. So this was Maison Citroën. Um, and, and what we did is we tracked what would happen if Corbusier's perfect vision of this kind of um, uh, mass-produced uh, build, building, which in fact was done in collaboration mm -hmm. with Citroën, or is a pun on, the, on Citroën, uh, the car manufacturer, and we showed what, how, how the interior would change, how the, how the um, plan would change, and ultimately how this resulted in um, what, something that was hugely compromised that ended up looking a bit like a, um, uh, a kind of, this doesn't show the full effect, um, but a s suburban semi-detached home <laughs> in the UK. But there, there was something interesting in it. There was something, uh, actually, uh, some, something more fascinating and valuable uh, than the purity and, and the kind of emptiness of mm -hmm. Corbusier's original um, vision. And it's something that's been ironically happening to Corbusier's uh, buildings throughout, or since they were built. And a lovely example is picked up in and How Buildings Learn, which is the uh, housing estate in Pesach uh, outside. Oh, the yes, Rome. yes, where they had to cover the windows. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, it was a brilliant idea. Have a place that's bathed in sun, sunlight. Fabulous, except it gets too hot to live in. Mm. So um, I think I even saw that building, yes. They, they'd had to stick... The people who worked in there in order to make it tolerable had stuck um, big bits of cardboard over all the windows. Well, well bit by bit, they reverse-engineered Corbusier's five points of architecture. So the, the flat roof leaked, mm -hmm. so they put on a pitch roof. Mm -hmm. The ribbon windows let in too much light so they block them up into smaller windows. Yeah. And Stuart Brand goes there and speaks to a javelin maker who ha seems to have occupied one of the, one of the buildings in, in the documentary. Yeah. And, it's, and uh, the richness of the place, as it's described uh, in that documentary and in a fantastic book by Philippe Boudon, a sociologist in the 60s, is so much more interesting than anything Corbusier could have come up mm -hmm. with on his own. The irony is, of course, he's now such a famous architect, they've had to wipe clean any changes to the estate to reverse it to its original state, so that it's now its preserved. original non-functional state. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. non-non-functional functionalist architecture. Yeah. Uh, can we go back to to the bigger here? Because it feels like we we skipped. Oh yes. That, and I'd be really interested. We talked about the long now. We talked about a kind of wider we, in in, uh, in the seniors and this idea of um, people 
collective. Oh, yes, and I realised I missed a chance to beat uh, Anne Rand over the head. We'll go for that. Oh, yeah, I, I can't, I, you can never, you must never pass up a chance to do that. Um, I, I don't know how many of you know the writings of Anne Rand, but she, she's probably the most influential philosopher of the 20th century, in, in some ways, I would say. Um, she was a sort of novelist, I suppose, in, in some respects. She wrote a book called Atlas Shrugged, which has been very, very important on neoliberals, libertarians, very big influence on the way they think. Um, she's adored by people like Alan Greenspan. And uh, a lot of the Trump people are very Anne Randy, aren't they? And just to give you an idea of her, that she wrote this book called Atlas Shrugged, which is a huge selling book, a very, very important book, which is all about the primacy of the individual and the idea that really everything will be much better if you just let strong-willed, powerful, intelligent individuals do their thing. That will be better for all of us, um, even if we don't understand what they're doing. So um, she is famous for several quotes, but the one I like best is, altruism is evil. <laughs> <laughs> so um, she's right in there with Margaret Thatcher, and there's no such thing as society. Um, they, they both believed that thinking about society was the same thing as social, socialism and was therefore the same thing as totalitarianism. So for them, any form of altruism immediately sort of shaded into totalitarianism. Um, they were both influenced by um, Frederick Hayek, who, who wrote The Road to Serfdom, which is uh, a more intelligent... Um, examination of that idea. Um, they simplified it down. But anyway, Rand still exerts a very powerful influence, I think, in, particularly in American thinking. Um, and this sort of simplistic individualism, which is held up by a few really, really shaky quasi-religious theories. One of them is the invisible hand. This idea that there's some sort of divine rightness to what markets do, and that if we just unfetter markets, that will automatically produce good results for the rest of us. And like all people who've, whose prophecies have failed, um, they don't say, actually, that really wasn't a very good idea. They say, we just didn't do it right. Mm. And you stopped us, you traitors, you saboteurs stopped us. Mm. Um, so there's a, there's a big struggle going on at the moment with that idea. So the, the second really crap idea is trickle down. Mm. The idea that if you let rich people get really rich, somehow they have to spend it somewhere. So actually, we'll all get richer. It'll somehow come down to the rest of us. In fact, any dispassionate observation of the last 30 or 40 years is, shows you that exactly the opposite has happened. It's trickle up. Wealth attracts wealth, and it attracts our wealth. <laughs> you know, it gets sucked up to the top. We now have inequality at a, a level that has never been known in human history. In fact, there's a very interesting book about that um, that compares inequality in Roman times when you had emperors with inequality now. They don't compare. They were amateurs at it. <laughs> they couldn't do inequality like we can. And there's a third crap idea, but I can't remember what that is now. But th this idea of um, well, the, the social impacts and the spatial impacts of, of this highly individualised way of thinking. You've talked before about how it, um, we talked about how uh, it's linked to a sense of insecurity and yeah. then how, how that insecurity plays out in the way that we build and design the built environment. Yeah. So there's a new book just came out. It's not available in England yet. Um, so I've only read a synopsis of it. It's by a woman called Michelle Geldfan. Uh, and I can't remember the title either, but it's, it's about what happens when people feel insecure. Now, feeling insecure is something that more and more people are doing now. Um, you know, with all of the things that we know are happening where 
kids are looking at a future that doesn't look as good as the, f as the past that we lived in, in many ways. People are looking at much less job security. Unions don't exist practically any longer to fight for working people. That in all sorts of ways, things seem to be eroding from what seems now to have been a sort of apex of post-war capitalism. Um, so this book is about what happens to people's minds when they see themselves in a situation that is fearful rather than hopeful. And one of the very interesting things is that people are attracted to authoritarianism in those circumstances. They don't want uncertainty. They don't want to be told, hey, we'll make it up as we go along. They want people who say that they know what they're doing, even if they transparently don't, who have the stamp of authority and the confidence of authority, which is why you see so many old Etonians in government now, because the one thing you learn at Eton is confidence. That's all you learn, really. <laughs> no, actually, it's a very good school, but they're particularly good at te teaching that part of it. Um, and so... so you get this move towards authoritarianism, towards wanting to know how everything is arranged, not wanting uncertainty, wanting to live in communities that are homogenous, mm. that, um, where you kind of know that everybody else is pretty much the same view mm. as you. This is very much a result of um, feeling threatened. Mm. And, you know, in the last 20 or 30 years, governments particularly ours and the American government, have discovered that you can only really motivate people to work as a community by hope or by fear. They've given up on hope, and they're very good at fear now. This makes me think of this book, another Jane Jacobs reference, but Dark Age Ahead. Um, nice cover. Which was uh, written in, I think, 2004. It talks about how cultural xenophobia is a frequent sequel uh -huh. to a society's decline from cultural vigour and, and talks about this fortress mentality, which yeah. is very much what you're talking about. She talks about it at the scale of, uh, of America, really, the yeah. future of America and Western civilization having a dark age ahead. Yeah. Predicted it quite accurately. But that fortress mentality plays out into the built environment in very uh, tangible ways, whether it's through, in this city, um, the increasing spatial segregation of affordable housing from the housing that's funding it, mm -hmm. uh, cross-subsidizing it through off-site uh, ho affordable housing provision uh, at the scale of a building through things like tour doors. Yep. And of course, more generally and across the world through typologies like gated communities. Um, you know, the gated community is the perfect expression of this. Why don't we give them some good news? <laughs> I'd love that. <laughs> There's lots of bad news and you've probably heard a lot of it. But what I've been finding recently is that there's a new kind of cohort of thinkers, um, most of whom are women, I think, interestingly, and many of whom are economists, um, who are starting to realise that the, the sort of solution to these cul-de-sacs that we've got ourselves into are not found by narrowing our vision by that technique, mm. but by expanding it. So I'm thinking of um, Kate Raworth in this book, which you just stick it under. Yeah. yeah, just so people can see the cover. This is a, a really, really inspiring book, which I've just finished reading for a second time. Um, and in the book, she... I, I'll praise it very briefly. And since her husband is here, I shall apologise already for <laughs> if I leave important parts out. Um, so she says that classical economics really sees two players, the individual and the state, and they are mediated by the market. So, so that's the dynamic, basically. And, you know, socialism is, emphasises the state, capitalism emphasises the individual, and all the arguments are about what that balance should be and how that market should mediate between the two. What Kate Raworth says is, actually, 
that's a very impoverished picture because those, those two players exist within the context of the environment, the world. You know, we all sit here using this um, resource, the rest of the universe, everything that isn't us, <laughs> that's the resource. Um, but because it doesn't have a, a price tag to it, we don't include it. Um, in economics, if you can't count it, it doesn't count. That's traditional economics. So, so it doesn't, you know, clean air doesn't come with a price tag. Water doesn't come with a price tag until recently. Um, but essentially, anything that isn't monetized doesn't fit into classical economics. And the other thing that isn't monetized is care, the household. All the things that women do, for example, and have done for forever, um, don't figure. You know, if GDP will, if I throw this glass on the floor and they have to go and buy another one, that little amount of money figures as part of our GDP. If, um, if I spend the evening looking after an old person in a wheelchair, that doesn't figure. That, that is not a factor. So Kate Rayworth is saying that apart from that dynamic, there's a much bigger dynamic. She calls it donut economics, outside and inside that one. Um, so she and Mariana and Kate Pickett and Jayati Ghosh and <coughs> lots and lots of interesting women who are starting to think about economics. And economics, of course, is a very big subject. It's morality, it's ethics, it's um, social organization, it's everything, actually. <laughs> It's one of those huge subjects that fringes onto everything else. Um, I think they are starting to reconceive a different way of thinking about the world. Um, and I see enormous hope in that. So that and I, I have a word for it. Sheikonomics. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll hate it, but because I'm now gendering something. We'll, we'll let Mariana be, be the judge of that. Um, so I think that's a good point to start to open it out, uh, a point where we've talked about the longer now, this kind of wider sense of we, but also um, what could be bigger, a bigger here than the, than the world we live in. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd, it'd be good to take some questions. I'm going to take them three at a time, uh, and then we'll work our way through them. Um, we've got about uh, just less than half an hour for questions. Um, so... Who wants to ask something? We've got one here. Any other in this area? One here. Well, look, three in a row. Okay. You talk about planning. And I was at another talk, and someone was saying, oh, this is great. Um, you know, what we want to do is have lots of green spaces and everything is too dense in the city. And then I had a guy from, I think it was Friends of the Earth, said, oh, the trouble with transport, if we want people to give up their cars, we've got to make cities denser. And there, 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 there was this problem. There always seemed to be a lot of, uh, a, 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 a lot, lot of conflicts. Um, what is your uh, view on that? And is, um, is, is a solution possible? It's interesting. If you look over the last 20 years, it strikes me inner cities have actually done quite well over the last 20 years. Look at London now compared to 20 years ago, New York, lots of other places. Suburbs maybe okay. not move forward so much. So we've got the question of density uh, over there then in the middle. So I want to ask a question about benign dictators. I've noticed quite a lot of seemingly intelligent people think that the only way to solve long-term problems like climate change and so on is that we need benign dictators to sort it all out for us, people like Sir Martin Rees, or Lord Rees, James Lovelock, many, many others. And implicit there is a kind of idea that we need to become like China or Singapore, and there's the kind of Le Corbusier top-down mm. planning mentality behind it. So how do we create a regenerative politics, mm. let's say, a, a politics of gardening that doesn't take us down the road of that top-down, benign, so-called benign planning mentality. Mm. Okay, thank you. In the middle. Um, I'm interested in this idea of uh, your example of the of the, the system of music and how that applies to the um, to to, uh, to to the built environment. And um, you know, the things that we we enjoy about cities, largely uh, uh, certainly historic cities, has been a product of pretty much unfettered development um, within the constraints of, let's say, um, building technologies or um, or politics or, or um, good economics. Um, 
and in a way, that what you're talking about, the, 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 the idea of a, a top-down uh, top development um, uh, environment is, is the opposite. I'm trying to, trying to reconcile this idea of, 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 of what we think is, in, is enjoyable uh, and, uh, and about cities with the, uh, the, 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 the providing a system which is too dict dictatorial. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. We'll take those three. Okay, so... I'll start just anywhere in those. Um, there are examples of systems that are not dictatorial that work quite well. <laughs> um, they're mostly Scandinavian. And it's very interesting to me that, that we don't actually ever learn from them. Um, for instance, Finland, by agreement with nearly every teacher I've ever spoken to is reckoned to be an incredibly effective education system. Why doesn't anybody else copy them? Why, do, why are we so proud that we can't just say, you know what, that's a bloody good idea. Let's, let's just do the whole thing and adopt the whole thing wholesale and see how it works. So as, as regards um, dictators, I think that's a very... I'm sure you think too. It's a very lazy solution to the problem, and it's not actually a very good solution. It, it historically has never worked very well. Um, well on, some, on some measures, I, I did a. Um, this is the point where I start to defend dictators. <laughs> no, it's, uh, but I was. Well, you, you know a lot of architects. I, I do, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I've worked for some architect dictators in the past. I think. I think. Uh, I, I was really interested in um, the the kind of political conditions with which we built um, bits of city built environment that we value uh, over time, particularly over a very long period of time. So I did an incredibly nerdy study uh, of um, broad, uh, looking at all of the UNESCO World, World Heritage Sites uh, in Europe, just to start off with, I didn't get beyond Europe, um, and categorised them um, uh, as to whether they were commissioned or created by, broadly speaking, a democracy a totalitarian regime of some form mm -hmm. or another, uh, a dictatorship. Um, uh, I think there was a kind of tribal and prehistoric one, uh, or a socialist or communist kind of political model. Um, and uh, as you might imagine, the vast majority of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites that are designated, even within Europe, uh, were, were created by um, uh, dictatorships. Uh, and, um, and I, I mean, I think there's clearly some, some obvious uh, conditions they create in terms of um, being able to mobilise huge amounts of workforce, um, create sums of capital, having a kind of singular um, long-term um, perspective that's to do with perhaps their own um, hereditary uh, kind of form of govern uh, governance as opposed to a, a political cycle. I think it does ask some really but don't, big, don't deep think... questions about what, what we also preserve uh, and choose to preserve. But I, I think this goes to the question you asked. Um, so if we look at the built environment, of course the spectacular things mm. are probably those built by, spec exactly. by I was going to say spectators, but yeah. dictators. Um, but actually a lot of the things we love are grew up out of loads and loads of people over a very long time crashing together and making things. Um, we, we just spent a week in Cadiz, which is a beautiful small city in Spain. Um, complete tangled mess in a way, but absolutely charming place. And was obviously the results of lots and lots of negotiations between people. In fact, I remember Rem saying something to me once that was interesting. He'd, he'd just been in Nigeria. And he said, it's, crossing the road is absolutely terrifying because you have to negotiate with every driver as you cross <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't have a, like a light that goes on where you just wander across you you actually have to kind of make eye contact oh, I'm crossing this I'm human I'm alive still um, and make your way across so so and then he said I found that quite liberating after a while mm. um, that that you're constantly in conversation and I think the the non, the other side of architecture, the kind of architecture you see in Cadiz, where of course there is a cathedral and there are one or two grand buildings, but the experience of the place is the result of this 
endless long-term negotiation between people living together. And those negotiations are mediated by all sorts of things, including good manners. That's actually probably the main thing. Of, you can't go and put that there because that cuts off all their light. Um, you can't do that because it's too narrow for anyone to get through, all that sort of thing, you know. Um, so, mm. so I think, I think um, city building of that kind is the pop music of architecture. Yeah. You know, we, we still have this distinction of fine art music, which is supposed to be all thought out and, you know, clever and intense. And then this transitory stuff called pop music, which actually embarrassingly turns out not to be very transitory at all. Mm. <laughs> still, still hanging around. <laughs> and, and to just build on that before we go on to some other questions, that, that's clearly what interests me about being a planner is being able to work on, on the everyday, people's everyday experience of lives, these everyday, everyday negotiations, yeah. as opposed to only designing the icons that the architects get their hands on, the, the, the set piece um, concertos. Uh, I but just want to read something from this. This is, this is their manifesto. Um, there's a nice sentence in here. Public planning, planning only works when the public plan. We believe in giving citizens the knowledge, knowledge and tools to shape their environment. Mm. That's a nice idea. <laughs> and I, I think that we're lucky in a way in Britain to have a system that is still very negotiated when you compare it to uh, a lot of other say, European systems um, that are a lot, a lot more clear cut, a lot more black and white. And it's those forms of negotiations that are really just forms of politeness that have manifested themselves over time into planning documents that are that now, uh, now that thick. But you can read those kind of negotiations, discussions um, in the way the city develops, as you know. And, and um, I think that's, that's what creates the form of London to be so idiosyncratic and messy and extraordinary compared to cities that have been planned in a much more clinical way. And, and that's sort of the answer to what you're saying, that though, those, um, those discussions are endless and messy. You don't, you don't ever finish them, really. Mm. But, you, know, the, the, you really have to think of a city as an, a completely unfinished symphony. You know, it's going on all the time and it's... It's going to change, and people will always be arguing about it. But that's fine. Arguing is fine, really. OK, let's have some more arguing and more questions uh, here, here, and then we'll go up there in the middle. Thanks. Good evening. I was interested in your comparison with the shearing layers of architecture with society and culture. Uh, having dealt with a Victorian building and trying to put fiber optic cable into it, Yes, you can move the furniture around and walls a little bit, but bringing it up to modern standard is very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I've watched them at uh, near Regent's Park where they've, they've just torn down the whole building. They just, they just, they just leave the facade yeah. and a brand new building is built behind. And what I'm most interested in is your comparison with human beings with the genetic level of those aspects of humanity and culture that are actually biologically inbuilt and they are not changing because there is no, there's no, nothing selecting them out. Mm -hmm. And the speed of the change of the environment and how society and human beings are able, all adapt adaptation is taking place outside of our biology, as it okay. were, to adapt to the environment. And I would be interested in your thoughts in that space. Thank you. Okay, there's a question in the middle up there. Sorry, behind you. Yeah. Uh, hello. I just wanted to ask a bit more about this, the relationship between the, the planner, the architect, the, sort of the bureaucrat, and the artist. Um, and I'm a bureaucrat. Uh, I call myself a bureaucrat hacker, bureaucracy hacker. Uh, um, and I've worked with you, Finn, before, mm. so you know that we have infiltrated the system <laughs> and we're subverting it to make it better. Um, but this idea of... Um, yeah, the relationship planner, architect, whether there, there is a sort of a sweet spot. I'm thinking of two examples, two cities. <coughs> One is Brasilia, with like amazing planner, Lucio Costa, an amazing architect, Oscar Niemeyer. And it's a city that's not functionally non-functional. It's an, another example of a, uh, uh, it's like a marsh, it's, it's, a, it's a city for Martians, it's not for yeah. people. And the other one is Barcelona. I am from Barcelona, disclosure, which is Plaza Arda, the grid, amazing plan, 
thought, you know, top-down plan, and Anthony Gaudí, crazy ar ar artist, architect, doing ergonomic, um, unlivable houses, but beautiful. Um, and actually, the Plaza Arda was imposed by the government because yeah. another architect, another planning w won the won the the tender, but the government said, "No, I'm sorry, that's what we're doing." So, well, dictatorship. Thank you. And there was a. One more question down here, I think, round off this lot. So it's down here. No, oh, okay. seems to be, there was a question here, we'll come to, I'm sure Marianne will have one soon. <laughs> it's just a thought, really, that um, in relation to the last conversation, it seems to me that one of the problems is that we separate far too much the product from the process. It sounds like a trite thing to say, but it's just really true it seems to me, and, and is the source of a lot of the problems. And in relation to music, uh, it seems to me we need to be thinking not just about uh, symphonies and how beautiful they are and finished and all that, but live music and yeah. participation. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, it seems to me it's a very good metaphor, music, if you extend it that far. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you can apply it in some ways to almost everything. I mean, that doesn't make it easy to achieve, but yeah. it is about participation in some yeah. ways, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Really much Okay, Brian. The first one is quite hard. <laughs> Adaptation outside the genet genetic level. But of course, that is something humans have been doing for a very, very long time. For instance, tools are really extensions. You know, I suddenly can now lift 75 tons if, I'm, if I have a crane under my control. So, so humans have been adapting themselves in in those extra-corporeal ways for a very long time. And now, in the last 25 years or so, we've been adapting ourselves mentally. So we now have infinite memory, called Google. Um, and we have infinite calculating power on my little scientific calculator. Um, so, so I think we... I. I got the feeling that you were slightly worried about the prospect of there not being um, a concomitant um, genetic keeping up with those changes, that you felt that, um, that the corporeal part was getting left behind somehow. Um, I worry about that as well. Um, I've for years been wondering why the interfaces of computers are designed to reduce us to a level of stupidity. You know, I've, I represent, and so do any of you, several million years of muscular evolution. We're incredibly fine machines. And what does that translate into? It translates into this idiotic action. So between all this intelligence, physical and mental, and all that intelligence in the box is... This is a complete design failure. Um, Anyway, so that's, that's the answer to that question. <laughs> that's not a very good answer. <laughs> the, the second question you'll have to answer because I didn't... I'll really come on to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I'll go on to that now then. Um, so I think yeah, we, we, we draw very clear distinctions now between the, the, the planner and the architect, uh, the bureaucrat. Um, 40, 50 years ago, when half of all architects were working in the public sector, there was no distinction. The planner and the architect had the same kind of education, they did the same kind of role, and as a result, that role had a lot more agency, uh, a lot more influence. It genuinely could shape the, the places um, that, that, that were being built by that welfare state at that time. Um, and that's an extremely exciting uh, kind of job to do. It's why a lot of us have gone into planning and architecture. But when you now go into these roles, they, they tend to have been fragmented or subdivided, mm. partly through the professionalisation of the industry and commercial pressures as well. So working in the local authority to, to shape a place, I need to speak to the, you know, the, the urban design officer, the estates team, the development management officer, the policy officer, the arboricultural tree officer, um, not to mention all of the other kind of consultants that you'd have to bring in to make a project happen. And I think that, that fragmentation is something that um, 
that inevitably means the roles that are left are important but not so exciting in their own right. And what we're trying to do through public practice is reintegrate some of those roles to show that bureaucracy isn't necessarily a bad word in the same way that compromise isn't a bad word, mm. but it can really be a creative discipline. Um, Brian talks about how you know, everyone inherently is creative, mm. and I think we've, we've, we've um, allowed a false myth to be uh, to, to be developed that somehow bureaucracy is only reactive, that the innovation is happening in the, in the private sector. And the person who's expressed that better than anyone is Mariana. And, and that's a kind of real rallying call for us all to rethink what bureaucracy could be in a creative way. Raina Cattell as well, who's the director of IPP, um, talks a lot about uh, the, the, the potential for, for bureaucracy to be creative. Uh, we, we desperately need that now um, with an absence of, of genuine vision coming from the other players in the built environment. Um, so hopefully it's, it's starting to happen. Now to your question. Um, I think one of the things you pick up on when you see a piece of art or hear a piece of art is not only its internal uh, relationships, you know, oh, that note and that note and this chord and so on, but your sense of how it, how it came into being, how it was made. And I think that's actually a very important message in any piece of work that... <laughs> So it matters to me, to, when I listen to that Terry Riley piece, to know that that was made in that way. Because that means I know that it will never be the same. So I'm hearing a unique version of it. The next time I listen to it, it will be completely different. Um, and to me, that's important because I think what is pleasurable in art for us becomes thinkable in life. So when we find ourselves enjoying something that we know wasn't designed through the old classical processes that we know about, somebody writing a score and the oboes are going to do this part and the harp does that and so on. Somehow this piece comes into being afresh each time with this simple set of instructions. Um, when you know that's possible in, in a piece of music, you start to wonder whether that might be possible in the rest of life as well. And in a sense, the piece of music stands as a kind of little lab experiment. And you can't get away from the fact that you like it. You might think, it's not, surely you can't make a good piece of music like that. But actually, I like it. So this, this process of, of relating your understanding of how something comes into being, and, and I will apply this to the city of Cadiz, for example. I know that wasn't the result of town planners quite obviously wasn't. They would never come up with a mess like that. Um, but there's something really charming and intimate about the kinds of negotiations you feel must have happened there for it to exist. And that becomes part of the message of the place. So, so I think you're absolutely right. We're very conscious of process. You know, when you look at that um, Le Cabousier, Le Voisin, that nightmare city, you're very conscious that this, this is a sort of architect's masturbatory dream of a, a world where only the, only the mind, only the will has a place. There's no sensuality to it. Uh, there's no, no feeling for the people who live in it other than as sort of organic units of some kind that get located there. Who else can we bash tonight? Okay, I think we've got time for three more, one last round of questions. Maren has already got the mic. Um, <laughs> so first one, sir. Right, so the first time we met was, I think, similar, actually, to Rolly, when you uh, emailed me, and I ignored the email because I thought, it can't be really Brian here. It must be some <laughs> hacker from somewhere. And you invited me to go to uh, San Francisco to present my book at the Long Now Foundation. So I That's met Stuart Brown, et cetera. And then I found out about the Long Now clock, which you haven't mentioned yet, the 10,000-year oh, yeah. clock. And I wanted to ask you a sort of a provocative question that hopefully will make you feel a bit less comfortable, which is, um, you know, does finance matter? So that clock is mainly, but not only, funded, I think, with money from uh, Bezos, yep. who obviously has the money he has from Amazon, which is an incredibly short-termist company in two ways, not just because yep. of how they want to deliver the goods like on the day. It's not even tomorrow anymore. It's literally today. Mm -hmm. And we know how they pay or how they don't pay 
their workers to do that, but also very short term in terms of the actual wealth of that company has little to do with the profits it's making on the ground. It's actually due to its private equity ratio. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very interesting sort of you know analysis that one can make on how actually Amazon is quite different from, from say Google in that respect. So the Fangos, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Apple are actually quite different from each other in this respect. And I'm just wondering, did you actually have a debate with Stuart on whether it mattered where the financing of that clock came from. Because ironically today, precisely because of both tax evasion and financialization, it's actually these large private actors that have money for the long run. Mm -hmm. They have the luxury to be able to say, we're gonna fund you know, Brian and Stewart's 10,000 year clock. So if it's, you know, is there something beyond the long, and it actually has to do with the qualitative characteristics of the mm -hmm. finance? Because we had Amanda Levitt give a talk uh, here at the last, no, two sessions ago with uh, Hadil here, sitting in the front row, who moderated her. And Amanda talked not only about her courtyard at the VNA on how the source of the finance mattered in terms of the public sector, which actually allowed her the time, but also the exploration, the experimentation, and the characteristics of that experimentation actually had a lot to do with who the financer was. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of feels a bit ironic, actually, that your long now clock is being funded by Amazon. OK, any so more, Helen, no, any more I critiques? Think, I think, sorry, that was a bit long. Uh, shall, okay, shall we so just do that? Best, I think I should just do OK, that. just do that, and then sorry, we'll do two more, sorry. one at the back, one there. Um, but you know I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you do. Um, no, so, so the story with Bezos is rather interesting, because when we first formed the Long Now Foundation, uh, in 1996, about a year or two after that, we went out on a sort of field trip to see some interesting old uh, buildings in America. One was a Hopi um, reservation. Uh, that we went to see Walter de Maria's lightning field, which was... So we were just looking at who had done big projects in the past. And stringing along with us was this young guy called, with a weird laugh called Jeff Bezos. <laughs> Um, who had just started this, or was just talking about, hadn't actually even started this thing called Amazon, which I thought was the most crackpot idea I'd ever heard. <laughs> Who's going to want to buy books like that? I thought. <laughs> <laughs> and he was looking for investment at the time. <laughs> I, I thought, oh, that would be a waste. <laughs> Throw your money away on that. So, but anyway, he was, he was involved from early on. And uh, he, he expressed an interest very early on in, in the clock, which I haven't talked about. The clock of the long now is an idea of making a clock that will run in a mountain in Texas for the next 10,000 years. Um, actually, it's a bit of a long subject to go into. I, I, <laughs> I'm seeing the clock counting down there. <laughs> the clock of the short now is counting down. <laughs> um, so... Yes, when it, when it became Amazon and it became people pissing in bottles because they didn't want to take the time off for a break and so on, I started to find that very embarrassing. I do find that embarrassing, actually. Um, now, as regards wealthy people spending their money on things like this, I have no objection to that as long as they pay their bloody taxes. What I object to is people thinking that they're so uh, omniscient and above the law that they can decide that they won't put their taxes into the public purse. They'll make a decision about what they want to fund, like space rockets or, or even if it's um, you know, HIV research. Whatever it is, they're sort of saying, well, sorry, sorry you lot, I'll use all the resources that you, you're generating, but actually I shall decide what, what I do with um, the profits. So this is another example of socialising the costs and privatising the profits, and I object to that. Um, I, I think people can do, can do whatever they like with their money, really, but I really think, I really think paying taxes is a, is a jolly honourable thing to do. And actually, I think we should applaud people who do. Yeah. I, I think we should make it a, a point of social kudos to, to be a proper taxpayer. It used to be in the past, you know, after all, what did you, you gave money to the church or you, you were expected to contribute to the community and you were respected for doing it. Mm. Um, uh, here, here. Okay, we, we, I said 
yes to two more questions. We've got a very short amount of time, so they have to be very quick, but the microphone's already there. So this one first. Um, so my question, I have two quick questions. <sighs> And, and it builds Mine a little bit on the financing piece of it. So where does financing come from for long-term in initiatives, perhaps from short-term activities? And my question was, what about the power of the consumer, right? Because we talk about um, Amazon as a, an example, um, but really, what about where I invest my money? Do I choose to invest in companies like Amazon? So <coughs> have you considered the power of the consumer voice on all of us in this room? What can we do in small steps to make the change? And then my second question is timing. Mm. How long is it gonna take for us to drive change? Because um, we've got lots of examples globally, internationally. You use the Finland example. We convene in these meetings. It's a passion of the company that I work for. But driving change on a mindset for long-term value or the longer now is difficult. Mm. Okay, thank you. And finally. Thank you. I've just got a really quick question um, about, the, about the beauty of not planning a longer time. So I'm paraphrasing here, but the, there's that line about how everything grows respectable over time, even aging prostitutes and ugly buildings, and how, how there's a place for that in, in this model and the humanity as well as the planning. Okay, good. Right. Um, I'll, I'll start with that one. You just have to leave space for that. That's, that's the thing. You have to not finish your project, whatever that project is, to the point where it's not possible to penetrate it in any way. So if you, if you make things that are permeable, they invite, people are very creative. <laughs> if you give them the chance, they'll start doing things. They'll start changing things. We just often don't recognize it as creativity because we think creativity is the province of artists and scientists. But, but actually, ordinary people who don't call themselves those things are creative all the time. And they build cities like Cadiz and London. Um, and so you just have to leave the opening, not shut off, not use materials that they can't change, for example. One of the points Stuart makes in his book is that um, if you build with concrete, you make it very difficult for anybody to do anything with the building other than demolish it. It's, whereas if you work with plaster, it's possible to stick something up on the wall and to change it. So, so just as a very beginning, that's... that's just in terms of materials that you use, but actually in every other sphere as well. You can make things more or less permeable, and you should try to make them permeable, I think. Um, to your question, uh, I can't remember it now. <laughs> I will in a minute. I'd, um, I'd like to, whilst you're remembering, I'd like to just pick up on that point, that, that creating, creating that kind of space um, is doesn't simply happen through negligence or, or the, the system turning its back. It's an act of design, mm -hmm. uh, creating that space in a way that gives um, uh, an equality of, of opportunity and access to different people in the city. You know, we, we, can, we can turn our back on a planning site, but it's pretty clear what kind of interests will end up um, uh, determining what will happen there. Why we need good planners is not to jump to the solution, but is to, is to create a framework that allows the amazing creativity and diversity of people in the city to actually have a say in that space in the first place. Yeah, that's very nicely said. It's, in a way, the, the point of the planner is to stop, in, in a sense, to stop the invasion of capitalism, you know, because capital will know immediately what to do with any space that you leave it. It'll sure. find a way to monetize it. And sometimes that might be the right thing to do, but some, very often it isn't. It, that becomes a way of excluding the intelligence of other people. Now, finance was what you talked about. Um, gosh, I don't know. Have you any answer to that question? I, uh, all I can say is the question about how soon we're going to get there. Oh, yes, um, th that's what Which I is a good say. place to we're going end, there. probably. <laughs> we're going there. I mean, from my point of view, it's, um, there's no beginning and end, going back to the, the, uh, the conversation we've had about finishing or starting a building. Um, it's like a law of nature, that there are different interests. Uh, uh, it's a kind of human nature to, to think about 
in the short term, actually, mm -hmm. and, and in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the near here. Um, and that's a real issue um, that we constantly need to be battling against. Um, so I don't think, unfortunately, I don't think there is um, a kind of point where we'll suddenly reach uh, the kind of sunny uplands where everyone will be thinking long term. We, we have an economic system um, and, um, that, that incentivizes people to think quite uh, selfishly. And we constantly need to, to work against that, a bit like spring cleaning or something like that. It's a kind of force of entropy. Um, and, and that's why we need, I think, uh, bureaucrats and the public service. Um, in answer to the question of how long will it take to get there, we are on the way already, I think. We're, we're also on the way to total destruction. <laughs> the question is, which one would do we, do we get to first? Um, but I, I think... When I look at young people, I think they're very smart. They, they aren't... We tend to think they're kind of slightly ignorant and don't know what's going on. You know, don't you realise the planet is a burning up? Don't you realise that all the animals are going extinct? Well, actually, they do realise, I think. More and more of them realise. And, and, of course, to expect them to solve that problem, <laughs> because we didn't... <laughs> is stupid, but I think there is a, a real um, different kind of intelligence, and it is to do with this kind of thinking that these books represent, the, 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 which is all systems thinking. That's what all these books are about. They're all about trying to see what kind of system we're in. They're not about little parts of it. They're about trying to visualise the whole thing and see how it works as a, as a kind of ecosystem of ideas. I think that's a very good place to end. So I just thank Brian. Um, thank all of you for being part of the conversation. Thank you.